Okay, hi everybody. I'm Gila Glassberg, registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. And tonight I have a very special guest, Ellie Chavalis. Um, Ellie Chavalis, LMFT, is a licensed psychotherapist in private practice, blogger, author, lecturer, and online educator. Her specialties are narrative therapy which is really cool, couples counseling and sexual issues. Her book, Find Your Horizon of Healthy Thinking, teaches her narrative therapy technique for using the power of the mind to boost mood, empowerment, and quality of life, and is available on Amazon as ebook or paperback, which sounds amazing, by the way. Thank you. Her new digital courses, private practice, pro tips, and sacred, not secret, a religious family's guide to healthy, holy sexuality education as well as her blogs and books are linked below. So I'm going to link everything in, on my website. But um, Ellie Shava, do you have anything to add? I don't think so. I think that covers everything for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, Ellie Shava and I are in a WhatsApp chat together. And whenever anyone asks a question, there's like a joke, like Ellie Shava, do you have a blog about that? So Ellie Shava, you're really knowledgeable, and I'm really excited to talk to you tonight. So um, our careers, I guess, sort of cross paths because I do – intuitive eating and I help people heal their relationship with food, which obviously I also help people heal their relationship with their body and body image issues. And you being someone who really works in like in people's marriages and their intimacy and in, in such a private way, like I'm sure you come across like people who are struggling with their body, people who are struggling with their body in terms of intimacy. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is sort of epidemic. You know, sometimes when a person will disclose to me as if they're sharing something, because they are, you know, very personal, very private, I, you know, they'll say something like, I've never really had a great relationship to my body. I've never really felt comfortable in my own skin. I've had a complicated relationship with food. That's usually the kind of thing that comes up, I would almost say, more often than not, when you're doing different types of therapy, whether it's um, couples therapy, individual therapy, sexual issues, depression, um, whether it's garden variety topics that come up in the therapy office or relational issues that come up, you know, the very first relationship that a person has is a relationship to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we are, uh, we, uh, even as new babies, we're like aware of ourselves before we're aware of others. And um, all the other relationships that we have, you know, with the world around us, with our significant other, with the concentric circles of humans that that come out, you know, that, that come out from our world, with God, with the universe, it all starts with the self. So if I am at odds within myself, if I don't like what's inside of me, if I don't feel comfortable in my own skin or in my own head, it's going to be, it's going to affect everything, you know, emanating outward. Um, you know, so, so that's, you know, that, that, that comes up a lot. And there is sort of an epidemic in contemporary society, particularly with women, although I, I definitely think men get it too. Um, this feeling of, you know, you're always needing to be a little bit better, always needing to improve, always looking at the mirror and magnifying whatever you don't like and seeing that as something that needs to be corrected or ashamed of, uh, you know, and that'll come out in terms of relationships. Uh, you know, um, like for example, it's, it's not a great example, but like, you know, if you, if you were to come into my house and I had like, you know, a freshly cooked meal, I would be able to say, oh, I just made some soup. Would you like to have some? And I'd be excited to share it with you. But if I know that all I have in my house is, you know, spoiled food from last week sitting in the fridge, I'm not going to be that excited to share it with you because it's like, you know, why would I want to give you that? I don't even think it's so good myself. Mm -hmm. And so the same is true of ourselves. You know, we use a lot of people use the word intimacy as a euphemism for physical relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not always exactly the same. You know, there's physical intimacy, there's emotional intimacy, there's uh, intellectual, spiritual, there's all different ways. Intimacy means connection, means a, a willingness and a desire to open up more and more layers of the self and share with other and get to know more and more layers from the other person. And, uh, and, you know, so the more happy I am or the more comfortable or confident or at peace accepting I am with the layers that are inside of me on all of those, in all of those domains, the more I'm going to want to share it with someone that I care about, like that freshly cooked meal, you know, it's like, oh, I have something nice for you. Let me share it with you. If I feel like it's, there's something yucky there, then I'm going to be more hesitant to, you know, to put that out there, whether it's with a significant other or, you know, again, out there into the, into the world. But the most significant relationship we have is that, you know, that the one that we call the significant relationship. So that's where it's going to come out the most, particularly in the area of physical intimacy. 
that's such a good analogy like the the fridge analogy like what if something's in your fridge that's like spoiled and like you don't feel so good about it you're not going to want to share but if you're happy to with your, if you're happy with the product then you're happy to share like that's such a good way of looking at it so so now i guess in in 2020 you feel like there's there's an epidemic like it's even worse that women feel like they don't want to share what they have yes i i think so i you know it, it it's funny i was just on a website, a clothing, a popular clothing website that markets specifically to young women um, with my kids. I, I don't want to name the site because I don't want to, you know, my point is not to shame the models who work for that site. Um, but I was so disturbed and I mentioned it to my, my teenage daughters. I was so disturbed at the, at the, the look that whoever was posing these models was going for, you know, they, they looked um, they looked disheveled and malnourished and miserable. They weren't smiling. They looked um, subservient. Um, and, and this was beautiful. This is considered beautiful. Um, and it was really, it was like heartbreaking to me a little bit, you know, and, and they may be very happy women, you know, but, but the positioning and the posture and the styling of this look is so, it's so waif-like, it's so disempowered. Um, you know, I, I think that part of the problems in, in contemporary society that we're uh, encountering today at both a literal level and a metaphoric level is that everyone wants to feel worthy of love. Everyone wants to be accepted and belong and appreciated. But I think that a lot of women have internalized the message, the notion that in order to be worthy of love, we need to make ourselves smaller. Mm -hmm. And a lot of men have somehow gotten this message that in order to be worthy of love, they need to be bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the solution is that when it starts really with children, but we need to, you know, we can always reparent ourselves as well. You know, when, when children get the message that everyone starts out being worthy of love, all right? Everyone deserves love and connection and, and we're not defined by our size. We don't need to focus on our, our physical size and we don't even need to focus so much on our intellectual size. You know, we need to focus on our, uh, our character. We need to focus on our contribution of, uh, to society, to other people, to relationships. We need to be able to contribute to ourselves so that we can spill over into other people. You know, when we are able to uh, be nurturing of our inner selves, whether it's our physical inner selves, meaning the inner workings of our physiology rather than the external presentation of our of our skin or size, um, or our emotional selves rather than the image that we're trying to present on social media or in in a peer group. Uh, you know, that's when we that's when we really are acting in a way that's loyal to who and how we want to be. And then the people who get to know us are getting to know the real us, not the one that got you know all, all dolled up for the world. You know, a fake right. version. Right. Yeah. So like, I guess this, we're talking a lot about like intuitive eating and I guess like body positivity or even like body neutrality, like there's so, we're not saying like totally don't like take care of yourself. Of course, 100% take care of yourself, eat in a way that feels good move in a way that feels good. But like, if you're not, if you're only um, focusing on like how that makes you look physically, then like, you're not really focusing on like the most important thing in your in your life with which is like who you are as a person and like you you said like you're worthy no matter what like you're worthy yeah. just because you're a person right yeah totally so so i said this when we were talking before but like i, I wasn't able to find who said it but i heard on a podcast a different podcast um with a marriage therapist, I'm, I'm really going to find it and I'm going to put it on my website, but they said that the number one issue or one of the main issues in marriage is that a woman is insecure about her body. And that really brings up a lot of issues with intimacy. Yeah. Do you feel like that's one of the main issues in marriage that you're seeing? It comes up a lot. It absolutely comes up a lot. Um, you know, uh, part of when we're talking about, let's say the physical intimate relationship, right? The sexual relationship. So there are a lot of different reasons and barriers why a person might have a fear of intimacy. And when I say fear of intimacy, I mean, it could be physical or emotional. Sometimes they go hand in hand, sometimes it's one or the other. Uh, but so often you'll hear a woman describe her hesitation of uh, wanting to, women don't want to be undressed in front of their, of their, of their loved one, of their partner, you know, even if it's dark, because they're just like so uncomfortable in their own skin, so ashamed of the way they believe that they look. And I say the way they believe that they look, because I think that so many people have distorted body image. Even something, I mean, you would know this better than I, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical professional, but, um, you know, something like, let's say cellulite, right? Everybody's got cellulite to some, Everybody. even better, right? Sorry? Everybody. 
everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it would actually be, you know, unhealthy to not have a certain amount of, of padding on the body. But mm -hmm. somehow the first time some, you know, preteen or teenage young person sees cellulite on their body, even if they're in very good athletic shape, there's this like horrifying feeling of like, there's mockery. I, mean, I remember there being jokes about cellulite, you know, as, as yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, and so, so that's, that's, you know, where a lot of the shame begins. Sometimes it even starts younger, um, you know, when, when people hit puberty, young men and women, or really boys and girls, you know, like 11, 12, 13 years old, and their bodies start changing. A lot of them are not informed enough about what's going on with their bodies, and they start to get grossed out by their own bodies. Mm -hmm. This is something that comes up a lot when you're doing um, a therapy in the area of, uh, you know, bedroom stuff when it comes up, because the young adults or preteens are so fragile, <laughs> hormonally and emotionally and psychologically, they're developing into humans. And for some reason, it happens awkwardly for most people. It's not a, it's not a graceful progression for a lot of people. Um, you know, and so if they never learn, so it's, it's a normal thing. We expect 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids with their, their braces and their, you know, training bras, you know, the stuff that makes you a preteen to feel like, you know, they're getting used to it, but not everybody segues so um, comfortably and some people retain that body shame they just never really get comfortable in their own skin and they're always examining and and uh, and critiquing how they look and how they feel um, I've had I've had spell I keep using women as an example even though men are definitely plagued by this also just because you know we're both women I imagine probably a broad percentage of your listeners are, are women and and just hit um, statistically it's you know we see a lot more of these details with women but it, I don't mean to exclude them that they have this stuff too um, you know, and, and so I, I've heard husbands will, will tell me, it's just like, you know, when I'm trying to hug or hold or touch my wife, I feel her cringing away. I feel like she's rejecting me. Um, and, and, and she's told me, and I believe it to be true. She's not rejecting me. She's rejecting herself. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she doesn't want me to get to know that body because she doesn't like that body. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to share it. Cause like, why would you want to share something if you don't think it has value, right. you know? You know, yeah. and it creates a lot of, you know, barriers, you know, physical barrier, and it creates emotional barrier, and it really prevents people from having the closeness and the pleasure and the passion and the connection that I think is every loving marriage is, you know, right and privilege, um, you know, so that very often is part of the work that, uh, that, you know, that we do, that we do, I, when I work with couples, I sometimes I'll work with the individuals on their individual stuff. I actually have on my desk right now, I, I wasn't even intending to talk to you about this, but I have this book called uh, mirror work by oh no I lost you I mean I yeah yeah sorry. I'm so sorry it's it my my uh sorry about that I have to charge the phone I thought it was higher percentage than it was okay so can you see me again okay okay yeah so this, the book is called mirror work it's probably oh that's funny it's a mirror image so it's back that's, that's really weird that's really weird what Two of my clients last week told me about Louise Hayes is that who it is? Oh, how funny. I wonder if they're my clients too. <laughs> like I both, I never heard of it. And the same day they both told me about it. How weird I is like that happens a lot, right? Like sometimes you don't hear about something and then you'll hear it in surround sound. And Louise Hay is not a new zeitgeist. In fact, she passed away recently. She was right. a big deal many years ago. Um, but I actually admire her work a lot. And it's actually, she's a great ex example of where our two fields intersect. Uh, you know, because she talks about the the connection between um, psychological health and physiological health, but she comes at it with a little bit more of an Eastern perspective than traditional Western. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, it's very spiritual. And the the idea of her mirror workbook, and this is not only her innovation. A lot of people talk about this, but she just does a very poetic, beautiful job of breaking it down into exercises. Is having people look in the mirror. Just look in the mirror and behold themselves. And I'll, I've, I was telling people to do this before I found the mirror workbook because, but she just has such a beautiful way of putting it. So I moved to just giving the book, but just to look in the mirror and notice the, the words that are coming into your head, into your mind about what you're seeing in the mirror, noticing how so many people will say such mean things in their own head about themselves, so much meaner than they would ever even think or certainly say about other people. Mm -hmm. And to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to try to work on being kinder to myself. So just like a simple example, right? When we were, before we were trying to get the lighting right before we got on this call and I was saying, oh, you know, I like the lighting better when I take a picture of myself in my car than here. And I, and here, I, I didn't say this, but what I was thinking is like, oh, and my face looks a little pale and pasty, mm -hmm. right? It's not mm -hmm. a nice way to spell. I would never tell you that your face looks right. pale or pasty, right? right. <laughs> um, what, what if I just said, okay, you know, I, I feel like my skin looks kind of fair. You know, to yeah. just to try to, to change the language a little bit, be a little bit more gentle um, and not attach value judgments or criticism. Just notice what it is, um, you know, and, and be able to come, come forward with something confident, accepting. And that doesn't necessarily mean 
loving and embracing every feature or, or, or part of ourselves. I mean, that was a nice long-term goal, mm -hmm. but just to be able to accept it and love it the way we would our own children, just sort of yeah. say like, this is, this is our gift, you know? Yeah. There, that's actually, so one of the principles of intuitive eating is respect your body. Yeah. You'll notice it's respect your body, not love your body. Not love your body. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, um, a lot of, I do this with my clients all the time, but we, we talk about the things like that our body has done for us as opposed to the way it looks. So like function rather than aesthetic, right? Yeah. Like your body, like I have three healthy kids. Like I'm not the size I was when I first got married, but like I have three beautiful kids that my body created. Like that's crazy. Like when you think about it or like just like silly, simple things, like I made myself dinner, like I went to work, you know, um, I can breathe <laughs> like things that that you we take for granted but like it's it's really very powerful and I, I really it, it is definitely a journey but I feel like I, I when I look in the mirror and I don't feel like 100% happy like I don't even let myself have negative thoughts like and it's it's so freeing but like at the same time like what you're talking about like with marital intimacy and like not feeling good about yourself I totally could relate that when we're not feeling good about ourselves externally or internally and a lot of times they could play off of each other right um it's really hard to i guess like feel beautiful there are times where it is yeah. helpful to feel pretty to feel beautiful yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And that's why i don't agree with the movement there's a movement to not tell your children that they are that they look good and i'm, I'm not a fan of that i don't think that we should put a lot of stock in how our kids look or you know tell them all the time you're so pretty you're so beautiful you're that you know like not make their our approval or our praise contingent predominantly on how they look i think that that uh compliments about the way they look should be nestled and and uh secondary third you know way behind all the more important compliments um and and uh and praise and acknowledgments of, of the more important values that that they uh, embody but at the same time i think that a child who never hears that he or she is beautiful to look at, how, why will they ever feel that they're anything other than unattractive? Right. And so I, I, that, that's why I think it is good for, for kids to hear you say, I mean, it can be said in a, in a your smile lights up a room. <laughs> you know, I, I see the kindness in your beautiful eyes. Yeah. Um, you know, beautiful. you know, like, I love how you walk with such confidence that you know you have a wonderful soul, you know, mm -hmm. to say things that kind of combine the inner and the outer. But I think it's really important to give kids the message that there's beauty to them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because we are, we are physical beings. We can't get away from that. You know, we're not primarily physical, but the physical does play a big role. Like you said, it's our functioning, you know, in our tradition, I don't know if all of your listeners are, you know, Jew Jewish, but we're both Orthodox Jewish and our tradition, there's actually a blessing that we say every time we use the restroom, you know, and, and people might find that funny because it's like, well, it doesn't seem very holy to be using the restroom, but actually it's a blessing that, that celebrates the fact that our bodies work well, you know, the fact that we can eliminate waste and digest and process food is like miraculous and wonderful. I remember speaking to someone who, um, who she was Jewish, but she wasn't a practicing, you know, a, a Jewish law practicing person. And we ended up talking about that. And she said, I, I thought she was going to like think that that was a weird thing. And she's like, no, that's so brilliant because she, her mom had been on dialysis for a long time. And the, the text of that blessing talks about how, um, how wonderful it is when, when the parts of the body that are supposed to open open and the parts that are supposed to close close and they do what they're supposed to do you know allowing the substances that have to pass through different uh, cavities and and part and organs to do what they're supposed to do she was so moved by that because she had had an illness in the family where it didn't go so she appreciated that right. so like you said seeing the body as as a, a functional temple you know something that needs to be respected not 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 worshipped in its own right but something that can be utilized for worship of what's really important yeah. And um, just to like tie it back to like what we were talking about in the beginning, like um, our first, it's so smart that you said that our first relationship is really with ourselves and with our body. Right. And then we talked a lot about like um, teenagehood and like we, our bodies changing and everything. And I have this a lot in my office where like either the mother or the teenager is like, what's wrong with my body? I'm gaining so much weight. I'm so right. fat, whatever. You actually need a certain amount of fat in order to um, have your period. And that's yeah. very, very common that you would put on some body fat in order to get your period. So like, that's so normal and that's like a healthy thing. And it just, it just ties in all together that like, you know, like you think about like a chubby baby and like no one thinks there's anything wrong with like a chubby baby, but then like this goes, it, it kind of ties into the whole conversation about like, about the time period that we live in is just that like society and the media and 
the world at large is fat shaming, right? And telling us like, if you're not a size two, like there's something probably wrong with you. Like you just don't have enough willpower, or, like you're not motivated or you don't care about your health. And we all kind of carry that message around and it's, it's painful. Like I know that the only reason why I don't feel like that on a daily basis anymore is because I work on it. Yeah. Constantly. yeah. But people who are in my office crying about like their body and it's real, it's a real struggle. Like they don't want to be with their husband because they're embarrassed about their body when like their husband doesn't even care. Like he just wants his wife to be happy. It's like, it's so painful. It's like a real pain point for so many people. It really is. And I'm actually really glad that you mentioned that because it's true. I think that in the majority of certainly happy, loving, healthy marriages, that's very often the case. I, so many times a husband will say to me, yeah, my wife's been going through a rough time. I know she doesn't want to be together so often. She put on some weight. She's not feeling good about herself. Like they'll often throw that in as kind of like they'll understand, like they'll say she put on some weight the way they would say she has pneumonia, you know, <laughs> like as if that's a reason to not, you know, <laughs> you know, to like not be able to function because it's, it can be so incapacitating for people, um, you know, who become so preoccupied in a society that makes this so important. But there is something that I've seen also, which I think is important to mention, which is that even in 2020, um, there are partners or spouses who need to learn that it's important not to criticize uh, your spouse's body. Um, because there, there are people who will um, make pejorative either jokes or comments or complaints against the way their spouse looks, especially like you said, you know, once we've had children, our bodies change. And even people who are uh, very into fitness and exercise and eating very nutritious foods, their bodies are going to change. They're breastfeeding. They're, they're you know, they, it's, and even with age, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so it, it's expected, it's normal, it's understandable. And uh, that's part of the, part of the commitment of marriage is like loving and upholding and supporting your spouse. So, uh, so I, I think that, you know, I, unfortunately I have seen like more than a handful of, of cases where part of the problem was well, you know, the spouses will say like, oh, it used to be much nicer for us in the bedroom, except that, you know, then my body changed. And now I, uh, now I don't feel so comfortable anymore. And I'm waiting for the husband to chime in with, well, you know, to me, you're just as beautiful as ever. If anything, I, I even appreciate your body more because of the miracle that you grew our children in it. But sometimes they'll say like, yeah, I really wish you would lose some weight, you mm -hmm. know, or, um, or, or worse, or worse, you know, uh, yeah. that, that's at least the more civilized version of it. Right. Um, you know, and it's, and, and it's a shame. It's, you know, it, it, so I, I do think it's really important. And again, I'm using the stereotypes of the husband, you know, the wife being the weight conscious and the husband being the one who could either say the cruel thing or the supportive thing, but it can go the other way too. There's plenty of men who, you know, struggle with their body image and their feelings about, you know, their, their, the, the way that they carry their weight at different points of life. And, you know, I was thinking about this in preparation for our talk today. And I realized like, people are so accustomed to talking about body changes in the fertility years, you know, like having babies and, and recovering from that and, and puberty. But if you think about it, like bodies are constantly changing. You know, you're born a baby, babies change tremendously every month for the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, how often do we see a friend's child and be like, wow, I can't believe how big he got. Look at her, look at, you know, and, and, you know, somehow we celebrate that change in children, or we certainly should celebrate that change in, in children. And then somehow when it becomes teenagers, it gets like, you know, somehow it's a little more uncomfortable for them. It's a little more uncomfortable for some of the adults. This is, you know, I, you mentioned that course that I, I, that I just created because so many parents really want to get this right to be able to give over to their children, the beauty of their bodies, the importance of being kind and good and gentle and accepting of your bodies to prepare for a healthy adulthood body boundaries, um, you know, to really educate parents so that we can raise children who are not insecure and obsessed with the weight and food. Um, but anyway, so then throughout the life cycle, right? So teenage years, you're developing, you're growing, you're fill, filling out. And then at least in, in communities like ours where people get married relatively young, right? In their twenties or, you know, like thirties, and then they, and they're, they're hoping to have a family. So you're changing throughout all of those years. And then before you know it, you're middle-aged and guess what? Changing again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need bifocals soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a really so, good point. That's a really yeah. Good point. And so I think it gets you attached to those bodies because yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. supposed to change. Yeah. And 
I guess going back to like the whole respecting your body, but like mm. in such, it's such a positive, gentle way to look at yourself, but like just thinking about the baby, like the changes from like one month to two months to three months, it's like so miraculous and so beautiful. And like, we, we celebrate when they, when they gain five pounds and we're so excited. And then like, suddenly, like when we're an adult, it's like, oh my God, I gained five pounds in the whole world. You know? <laughs> Let's flip around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, this, I think just, I just want to throw this out there for, for you or listeners, but there's actually a new book out. It's called Anti-Diet by Christy Harrison. And it's, it's like how dieting steals your time, money, and energy. It's really an excellent book. And it's, it's like how to use intuitive eating. It's like, I guess, not the sequel, but it's based off of intuitive eating. And um, this is like a really important point that I want, I want to like sort of just like make clear for the listeners that like diet culture is so loud and it's so painful. Like it doesn't serve us in any way. It only makes us feel really, really bad about ourselves. And it, it steals in a way, obviously it steals our money because like we buy into all these diet fads and everything, but like it also steals all of our emotional energy because even for the people, okay, 95% of diets don't work. Like they, like the research shows that like in the, in five years, you'll gain back all the weight. But for the 5% of people who do keep off the weight, keeping off that weight is a job. Every single, no, I'm serious. Every single waking minute of your day is what am I eating? When am I eating? Exercise. You don't have, you can't have relationships with people because you're so all consumed. It's obsessional. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to tell you something else. You don't have to be dieting to have that obsessional issue. Oh, you know, there are so many people who just have this obsession with their weight or what they're eating or they're just this preoccupation with, because they're really connected, like what you're eating and then how your body is metabolizing it. And I've had, I've had like husbands, again, using the stereotype, husbands will complain to me like, oh, I wanted to take my wife out for our anniversary or her birthday. And she's like, no, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have to be confronted with like food, you know, that that's, that's miserable for me. I, I'd just rather stay home, you know, or, or people who are trying to get dressed to go out to a party and they're like having an emotional meltdown in the closet because they don't like how anything's fitting because they had a baby four months ago or because they didn't have a baby four months ago, but they just don't like how everything's fitting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so you're right. I mean, it's, I mean, I guess like, you know, the, the obsessional dieting is, is definitely dangerous. And even, even when it doesn't manifest as dieting, the obsession with just hating on and loathing and rejecting a person's body and, and feeling like any bite you eat is stolen waters. Mm-hmm. is just, it's such a sad way to live. Yeah. And I have, I actually have this, this theory and I see it with my clients is that, um, the more that we think about like dieting and what we're eating, the more we like hide the deeper problem. Like that is what I see people are doing. Like they don't want to talk about like their fight with their husband or like that their child's not doing well in school. It's like a lot easier to like upset. Like an addiction model. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of like the addiction model and, and OCD, a lot of anxiety disorders are predicated on that idea that there's a core anxiety. There's a core problem, a core fear of something that's generating stress. Sometimes it's an internal thought process, something it's sometimes it's an external stress in the person's life, but that there is a symptom substitution going on where, um, you know, somebody will say like, rather than worry about the fact that my boss chewed me out and told me I might lose my job. I think instead I'll eat all the Oreos in the house. You know, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. so that that is where like we talk about like other coping mechanisms, you know, like sure. not you to cope with your emotions, which is like really powerful because it's like I also always say this. I'm like, this is obviously from intuitive eating. It's from um, it's from the principle of coping with your emotions without using food, and it's like noticing um, how food ha- may have been like your only friend in a time of pain like let's say divorce or loss or something and like yeah. you came home from like that painful event and like food was always there for you and like it's a comfort we call it comfort food i want to it's it. like it's like yeah. stable like we're never gonna yeah, it's it. always there for us yeah <laughs> it's like a good friend i once read this I, you would probably know a better source for this than i but that um you know, because, and this is not wrong, but that when our babies cry, if we're, if we're nursing them, we're breastfeeding them, or if we're giving them a, a you know, a drink of, of, of milk or formula. So they become conditioned to like, I cry, I'm sad, I'm distressed about something. And someone who loves me will manifest that love by giving me something like sweet and creamy in my mouth. Right. And then like, then it, you know, cut the scene 20 years later, sitting, I'm sad, I'm crying, I'm down. And I'm sticking Hagen, you know, vanilla Hagen-Dazs in my mouth instead. <laughs> 
we get into this habit of like pacifying ourselves with the comfort of food. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's, and, and then that, that's what turns into emotional eating. And the truth is the addiction model is also that, you know, turn to the, turn to the bottle, turn to the cigarette, turn to the hard drugs, you know, whatever it is that's going to numb the pain of what's really going on. I'll just get that dopamine hit from some sort of pleasure that I can give myself real quick. And that'll, you know, it'll be like some sort of psychological Tylenol. Um, I'll tell you a cute, a cute story that happened many years ago. I just remember it. We were out, my husband and I were out bowling with some relatives and friends. And um, and I'm, I'm a weird bowler. I, I, for some reason, I always either get a gutter or a strike. I don't often get like a few pins down. So um, so this woman who was at the game said to me, and we had some like snacks out. And um, and, and she said to me, Alicia, it's so funny because every time you come back from a strike, you come back like with a swagger. And every time you come back to, from a gutter, I saw you take a piece of chocolate. <laughs> It was so weird because I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was, of course, mortified. But I guess this, this stuff happens subconsciously. Well, actually, it's funny that you're saying about like the addictions model because yeah. according to intuitive eating and like the research about addiction, I lost you, Shava. Oh, I, know, I don't know why. Hold on. Okay, so it says that I'm plugged in for charging, but I guess it wasn't. I see. So sorry. Yeah, I, I hope it's charging. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I really hope you don't lose me. Okay. No problem. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, so like with intuitive eating, we, what I really like to do is like validate people's feelings about using yeah. to emotions. Because think about it. Like you just said, a baby's born. The first thing a baby does is drink from its mother milk with lactose, sure. sweet lactose. And it's actually very concentrated. That's nourishment. Yeah. That's nourishment, but it's not a bad thing. And like using right. food to cope with your emotions sometimes is really not a bad thing. And we not do it. Too. Come on, we do it all the time. Like oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the at the most basic level, the phenomenon of hunger, right? The physiological phenomenon of hunger. It's not a fun feeling, but it's a healthy cue because it, is it reminds us like, hey, like. Elisheva, you haven't fed me in a while. Like it's my body telling me like you need some more fuel in your system. So yeah. like most things, it's not a binary all or nothing, like using food because it tastes good or because it's like, let's say socializing with food, you know? So people will complain and say like, oh, people are always just going out to eat and inhaling all the calories. Well, you know, food is one of life's great pleasures. Yeah. And, you know, in, 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 like you say, healthy moderation and in an appropriate context and in touch with what we need is, is a great way to socialize. Yeah. 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 So we actually have it with intuitive eating. I'm sorry. I'm like, I just spoke at Hafter yesterday. So I taught the kids about the hunger and fullness scale. And that's yeah. like a really good way to get in touch with your, your yeah. physical signs of hunger and fullness, because we do all experience hunger and fullness in a different way, in a different part of our body. And they explain like there are, there are different qualities of hunger. Like you said, sometimes it's unpleasant, but sometimes it is pleasant. Like when we're not too hungry, it can be very pleasant. And that's like our body reinforcing us. To eat like if we didn't have those cues like we would die like we need to eat you know totally um so so another thing i wanted to ask you is i'm quoting a podcast again um but i heard on rena riser's podcast um rena riser is also an intuitive eating counselor and her husband interviewed benjamin weil who's an eating he's um, a dietitian who's also an, an intuitive eating counselor and he said something like i can't stop thinking about it it was so interesting he said mm -hmm. Um, most husbands would rather their wives weigh more, like way more, not W H E I W E I G H, way more. Be uh, happier, yeah. <laughs> and be happy than be like obsessively dieting and be like so grouchy. And like, I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Like, would husbands really like not mind if their, if their wives gained weight? I mean, that's what I think, like, because that's what I want to think, but like, is it really true? Yeah. And, I wanted to know what you thought about it. I would love to agree with that statement, but <laughs> I, I don't think it would be responsible for me to agree with it across the board. I look, I think that there are a lot of good men, a lot of really good men who would say that a hundred percent. And I think most of them would mean it. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's a good goal for a guy to feel. And I think there's also, there are parameters, you know, there's a difference between a man saying like, feeling obligated to say like, I wouldn't care if my wife, but you know, turned, became, you know, a 500 pound person, as long as, you know, she has the same good heart that she always did. You know, again, there's a physical relationship involved and, and there's a certain amount of uh, engagement and concern and, um, and practical implications for what happens with extreme weight gain. So, you know, but even barring extreme weight gain, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think you're right. I think most good men would rather, if we're talking about like not extreme things like that, 
most men would rather say like, I didn't even notice the couple of pounds you put on. Just, just relax. Just enjoy the ice cream with me. Just come to bed with me. It's not a big deal one way or another. But again, like I said, I've seen, I've seen the opposite. I've seen women who feel very tormented by their husbands noticing every pound that they gain or, you know, uh, wanting them to work out more, you know, unfortunately that is a phenomenon too. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not comfortable making that level of generalization, but I hope he's right. But do you find that like if this were to come up, like yeah. that, that a wife is feeling very insecure about her weight gain, yeah. a lot of the times the husband's like, I love you no matter what, you look beautiful to me. Or like, yes, I, yes, I, yes. I, I love like you even more now. Pardon? I love you even more now? Yeah. So, I, I, or, like, still love, still are very attracted to their body, like no matter what. So again, I, I would like to say that that's true the majority of the time. I can't promise that that's true every time because you know, men are imperfect, men and women are both imperfect. And, you know, and, and like, I, I guess, I guess you could ask the question the other way also, how would a woman feel? And I've heard women complain like, oh, you know, when we got married, we were both, you know, kind of fit. And, and then over the years, my husband, you know, developed a big, uh, you know, belly and that bothers me and it's uncomfortable and we're together and, and that's hard for me. So, you know, I, I, I don't think that we need to like micromanage how the spouse or the partner is feeling about their, about their spouse's uh, you know, body changes. It's more just sort of knowing what the right way to handle it is, how to express or not express or, you know, sh or lend support and acceptance so that we can do what we can to make our spouses feel loved and attractive and desired by us, um, you know, regardless of what they're struggling with or what they're feeling about themselves. So how could, like, how could one spouse support another spouse who's like struggling with their body image? So in the, in the best case scenario, they would say exactly what you just said in the name of that got Binyamin Wiley, you said was his name, you know, they would say, listen, you know, it doesn't matter to me whether you go up on, on the scale or down on the scale. It doesn't matter whether you're hard and muscular or, or soft and lovable, <laughs> you know, it, I, it, I, I love you, you know, I, I married you, I find you beautiful inside and out, and I just want you to be comfortable and close to me, you know, I, I think that would be an amazing thing to be, for a spouse to be able to say. Um, it, it's not always so easy, because it's not always so true that they feel that way, but if they do feel that way, then it would be fantastic if they could say it that way. Um, at the same time, you know, when a person, I think you and I might disagree on this piece, but I'll say mine, and then you can, you know, refute it, um, but I think, like, if, let's say a woman would say to her husband, listen, you know, I noticed that I've put on, like, I can see it on the scale, I'm not just imagining it. So we're not talking about distorted uh, body image. You know, I've noticed I put on some weight over the years and it does bother me. I don't like the way I feel, you know, I, I, I you know, I feel more sluggish and I want to get more, uh, more fit. And, and, uh, and, and the husband would say something like, yeah, no, you're beautiful. Just the way you are. You're wonderful. It's great. And, and if she turns to him and says, no, I, I actually do want to start, you know, uh, biking or running or, uh, making sure to, to drink water instead of soda or, you know, whatever she decides like she wants to do to promote her own health. Then I think in that case, it would be entirely appropriate for her husband to say, well, you know, if you want to do that for you, then good for you. And let me know, you know, what I can, do you want me to stop buying soda? Do you want me to make sure to be home at a certain time? So I can be on the kids while you go to exercise exercise, you know, I, I think that that's, you know, absolutely appropriate and okay, as long as it's, you know, something that was initiated, expressed and motivated by the spouse. And even then, I think it would be good for the, the, the not exercising or, you know, or whatever spouse to help conscious spouse to keep reinforcing, like, you're doing this because you want to do this. No pressure from me. I never asked you to do this, you know? Right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I don't even really disagree with you. I mean, yeah. I'm not like such a, I'm not a fan of like intentional weight loss just because I see like it doesn't really work. And I see yeah. that just from like the research and what I see with my clients is like the harder we push against our weight, like the more it tends to creep up. <laughs> um, but like to get healthier, to feel better, like a hundred percent. And I think, You're all on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important for like spouses to be like, not on the same page, like about what each of them are doing, but to support each other. Like I know tonight, like my husband likes to play basketball. Wednesday nights so yeah. sometimes he's like really tired and sometimes like I really don't want him to go because I haven't seen him but like if I know he really wants to go I'll be like yeah go like you'll have a good time and like I have a million other things to do you know <laughs> but um if it was like yeah you gained some weight like you should go like that would be like I would never say that that's hurtful that's a hurtful thing to say sure yeah and I would never want him to like I go to the gym like a few times a week and but like he's very supportive but like he's not asking me to go you know like and and sometimes I feel like that could even like what you're saying like it can even cause like some sort of a conflict like the wife really wants to go to the gym like three or five times a week and then like the husband has to come home early watch the kids or not buy soda even if he wants soda you know what I mean like yeah. there has to be like that level of like 
respect and and understanding each other's like feelings right absolutely absolutely and i don't think there's like a one size fits all formula for that kind of thing either you know because it, it also depends on the needs of each individual it depends on the dynamic of the relationship and within the family but that's just where like healthy communication in general comes into play you know if one spouse is saying to the other um you know just we're giving personal examples i remember um uh, uh, my husband always really liked coca-cola we used to joke he was like he's a coke addict you know like he would drink like way too much coke mm -hmm. um and then at a certain point a couple of like a year oh gosh he's like really keeps track of it like how many months he's been coke free um he just decided he did not want to drink coke anymore he knew it wasn't good for him. He knew he was having too much of it. And he knew he wanted to just go cold turkey on it. Um, and he's not like super health conscious, but he knew this was something that he really wanted to just eliminate. So we just stopped buying the Coke. It's not in the house anymore. And it was like a really big deal. He was so proud of himself and we were so proud of him. Um, you know, and, and, and it was just an, an example of something where when somebody is motivated by their own internal drive, so then it's, I think, the job of the loved ones to sort of rally around and say, yeah, you got this. We got you. We're supporting you. We, you know, we want you to be able to achieve that goal if it's important to you. Again, whether it's a health goal or a creative goal or an intellectual pursuit or a spiritual goal, you know, it's almost, it's almost like it just falls within the parameters of just being there for a person while they're doing their life, while they're pursuing their dreams. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's get practical. So let's, yeah. say, let's say within um, a marriage, there's one of the spouses is really struggling with their body image. Yeah. Whether or not it's related to weight doesn't even really matter. They just really are unhappy with the way that they they look. They don't feel good. Yeah. And um, the sp the other spouse is like very um, supportive. Is you how would you go about that? Like would you the one who's not feeling and, and let's say that's affecting their marital intimacy. So how would you like what are like one or two tips that you would give like listeners or what you would do with your clients if you're able to share like to help I guess sure. that spouse who feels bad about themselves or even the other spouse to support the other spouse. Okay, so there are actually kind of like two components to the treatment of something like that. I would say that the that the person who's struggling with the poor body image should do some individual work, you know, reading and journaling and, you know, exercises. I don't mean exercise like physical exercise. I mean like standing in front of a mirror and doing body acceptance work, uh, meditation, so that um, she can heal her or he could be, heal their relationship to their body. Um, and then in terms of integrating into the relationship, I would say as, as, as you know, working with a couple, I would ask the, the spouse who is, I would ask each spouse to help me understand what's lacking in their physical relationship. What's got, like, I'll actually be very graphic. I'll say, walk me through a typical encounter that the two of you will have. And so sometimes um, one spouse, let's say the husband will say like, my wife always like pushes my hand away from her stomach. She doesn't want me touching her belly. Right. And she'll say, well, my belly just feels like flabby and gross. I don't like, you know, I don't want somebody touching me there. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, well, for now, in general, the rule is like, if someone doesn't want to be touched somewhere, then we don't touch them somewhere, you know, regardless yeah. of the reason. So we have to start by honoring the boundaries that that person needs and create a framework and a menu of touch that's going to be enjoyable for the person who's struggling. And then what we do is that, I mean, that's kind of like where the intense work comes in and, and we customize and tailor it to the person, but, and to the couple. But we create a like kind of a, a smorgasbord of types of touch and exposure and connection that are going to feel good for the person who's struggling so that we can increase the repertoire of what feels nice in bed for them. And as, as he or she is doing their own work on body acceptance and learning to enjoy and appreciate and, uh, and honor the body that they have, again, you don't have to say love, um, just, just appreciate, accept, enjoy, and present to the other person as like, you love this and just if we're going back to that you know kind of funny f food analogy um so so if, if if let's say i have a few clients like this who uh, they get a lot of body shame from their family of origin mm -hmm. um and so they you know they were told that they were ugly and fat and yucky and whatever so it's going to be a lifelong job for them to sort of turn that around it's not something that happens overnight but if we're using that analogy of like you know if i have a delicious meal i'm excited to share it with you if i have gross food then i don't want to offer it to you but let's say i have let's say i'm a vegetarian but i know i have delicious food here that someone brought over that's that's meat i could say listen you know i i i'm not into meat but i would love to offer you i know this is good food you know and so um so a person could get to that place where you could say listen i right now if i'm looking at my body i haven't evolved and grown to the point where i can appreciate accept um and honor it the way it deserves to be but i i know that you do 
you know, and so when I come to you, I know that you find me beautiful. So I'm giving you the food that you like. I mean, it sounds really crass to refer to your body as meat, but I don't mean it that way, of course. Um, you know, I'm giving you something that I, you know, I, I'm presenting and sharing because I know that you appreciate it even more than I do. I had actually seen an article recently that I had like mixed feelings about. I wonder how you feel about this. It was a really sweet story. This woman wrote about how her whole life she was heavy and she always felt ugly and yucky and didn't think anybody would love her. And then she found that she married someone who she loved and he kept telling her over and over how beautiful she was and how much he enjoyed and appreciated and celebrated her body. And that made her feel beautiful. And I guess, I don't know, maybe this is like the post-feminist influence in me at this point, but but I was kind of like, I'm so happy for that woman that, that she, her story had a happy ending. But I don't know that that's a good tale, you know, caution, you know, learning tale to tell um, young people at this, you know, to take away from. Because I wish that woman had come to that realization on her own, that she didn't need a man to rescue her from her, from her poor self-image. Like, I wish she could have been able to look in the mirror and say, there is beauty in me and on me and with, like, all parts of me. Um, and, and that it wasn't like, oh, because somebody else told me. Yeah, I'm beautiful that I need to yeah. feel beautiful um, I have one client also who's a product of a very traumatic childhood um, very critical but also abusive and um, and she told me that she was having trouble doing the mirror work but she's like I tried so hard to tell to look in the mirror and say that I'm beautiful and perfect and I said whoa 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 who told you to say you're beautiful and perfect just accept yourself, right? If you're not ready to say that I'm beautiful, and by the way, I don't think anyone should describe humans as perfect. There's no need to do that, right? We're not God. Um, <laughs> um, just look in the mirror and say, I'm good. I'm worthy of love. There's more to me than what's skin deep, but what's skin deep is also worthy of love. Yeah. Right? Just kind of kick it down a notch. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's actually, I'm definitely going to be thinking about this article, like, because it's really, I have to process it, but like, initially when you said that, um, the entire world bases our beauty off of what the world says is beautiful. If you uh, about bases the, uh, off of what's beautiful, you said? The entire, every, like, we all think we're beautiful based on what the world tells us is beautiful. If you think sure. Sure. In, in now, right now, I mean, 200 years ago, being fat and being in a larger body was beautiful. It meant you were rich. It, it meant that you had a lot of food, right? And you sure. um, were taken care of. And if you were if you were smaller, it meant that you were weak and that you were poor. So right. in, you know, today we're really going by the beauty standards of, I don't know, the beauty industry. Um, Contemporary but, beauty. I also think, I had another theory about that. I don't, I've never heard this, but I wonder if there's any truth to this. I think one of the other reasons that a full figured woman has been considered beautiful pretty much throughout human history until the last, you know, less than a century mm -hmm. um, is also because like you said, you need fat to have a period and to be fertile. And fertility was something that was worshiped and really valued and put on a pedestal until very recently. And the contemporary secularized version of the Western world doesn't necessarily want to be producing families. And so, you know, the shrinking inward, you know, telling women go smaller, go smaller, go smaller. It's like, well, you know, we don't really care whether that messes with your health or your fertility or whatever, you know, as long as you make yourself really tiny, you know? Yeah. And actually, um, I have a lot of things to say, but actually in, in anti-diet, the book that I was talking about before by Christy Harrison, she was saying that every single time, okay, I, I'm going to get this wrong, but every single time that we like push the envelope for like women's rights, yeah, it's like um, this other thing happens where like the beauty industry like booms because like the society at large will do like anything to make us women like feel less than and like yeah. we buy into it like we buy into it like yeah if, if I'm not if I'm not a size two then I'm not good enough if I don't have blue eyes I'm not pretty if um, if the color of my skin isn't right then I'm not good enough and like it, it really affects our self-esteem and our self-worth and and like i don't know just like it's empowering for me to help my clients be like you're so much more than that like you, like you're coming to you're coming to my office because you care about who you are as a person like you want to be a better mother you want to be a better wife like you want to produce children <laughs> like you know just giving you be happy yeah yeah it's like yeah. crazy it's amazing also um back to that article i think it's, <laughs> i'm gonna think about this for a while but i think it's like actually important that you're that you're bringing that up because like when you were talking about the marital intimacy and the woman, let's say the woman struggling with body image and right now she doesn't, she's not so happy with her body, but she wants her husband to, she knows her husband's happy with her body. So I feel yeah. like it's a step, right? Like it's a step, like she doesn't feel beautiful, but at least because um her husband, her significant other thinks she's beautiful. That's like, a, it's like if she can't feel beautiful for herself, at least she could feel beautiful for her husband. And I think that that's, 
a really nice step into feeling beautiful for yourself. Absolutely. And I think that I think that's a great message for someone who is already in a marriage where they're being beheld and treasured and valued and appreciated by their spouse and they're struggling with their own self image. But I don't love that as a message to single people. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I think if you're looking at, at individuals who are not yet married, who want to be married, don't give them that message of don't worry if you don't like yourself so much because one day you'll meet a man who will make you feel, all, you know, kind of fill that void for you. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I would rather empower uh, the women to say like, hey, you know what? I have beauty, you know, inner and outer, and somebody's going to appreciate that someday, not wait for somebody to tell you. No, you know, there's this like popular song, um, you don't know you're beautiful. That's what makes you beautiful. Mm-hmm. So it's a really fun song, but I don't like that message. <laughs> right. Right. right, right. Yeah. right. Uh, you're not arrogant about your beauty and that makes you more beautiful, but that's not as poetic, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to say another thing about, about this body image stuff. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Checking out the article, anti-diet, of course. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say, but okay. oh, yeah. yeah. Anyways, okay, so it will come to me and I'll tell you. I, I, I thought of it while you were the, trying to think of that, I thought of another example of how body image stuff comes into play. Um, and, and this is something that I know so many, I definitely like went through a stage like this, not wanting to be in pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's so many women, like I, just, a, a couple of different women have told me their husband so badly wanted to display a picture up from their wedding and their wife's like, ugh, I don't like seeing myself in pictures. Right. Right. Even on the most like beautiful day of their lives, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, women who will say like they don't have a lot of pictures of themselves with their with their babies because they hated how they looked right after childbirth and so they they missed capturing those magical you know times those moments um, you know and and just like like you said this preoccupation with what you look like and what you're eating and how it's you know I don't want to present I don't want to share I don't want to give forth of what I am into the world because I don't I don't like it it's yucky um, yeah, yeah. Um, Rachel Tuckman actually she talked about this on one on her stories a few weeks yeah. ago about how like it's so true like and I do this with my clients also I don't remember if she spurred it or I, somebody else told me but like asking someone like I've asked clients who do you respect the most and like I, they thought about it for a while and then I'm like imagine if they got really really fat like would you respect them less what do they say so some of them who are really struggling with fat phobia are like yeah probably but like the but most people are like totally not like I don't even I don't even notice like what they look like right like, you know, like I'm not talking about like husband and wife. I'm talking about like more like friends. There's other people in your life, yeah. There's other people in your life, but like, yeah. I mean, I hate like just this is like probably gonna strike some emotional chords for some people. But when I saw Rachel post that, she's like, yeah, I I want my kids to have pictures of me like when I'm not alive. Like my mom passed away last year, and she was very embarrassed about about her weight, and like she, I barely have any pictures of her, and like it's really 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 hard, and like. I really don't care about her weight at all. Like, I really wish I had more pictures. So like, it's, it's, it's hard. It's emotional to hear that, but like, it's really true at the end of the day. Like you don't, I mean, of course there's some form of like physical attraction, taking care of yourself, putting yourself together. But like, th- there's, there's also very little, like there's not so much that we can control about our weight. And that's, I think also what affects people's self-esteem because they're like, well, if I could only like willpower myself to be a size two, like, I'm sorry, I will never be a size two, like, no matter what, like, you know, so it just gives people, like, it's, it's so, like, disempowering, like, if you just tried harder, you could look better, you know, like, could you will yourself to have blue eyes, like, you can't, like, it just can't happen, you know? Yeah, I once read a quote um, about parenting, and I think it might be true with, like, body acceptance, too, this woman was talking about how hard it is when her kids were little, and she was saying how, you know, my new approach to parenting is total commitment to the process, but total equanimity about the outcome. And I think that that's a great approach to health also, because I think that a lot of people have this like all or nothing perspective of just like, you have to be either obsessed with like dieting and the gym and fitness and getting that perfect toned body that, you know, is, is, you know, not really such a healthy goal. Or it's like, no, I don't have to care. I don't have to move. Right. I can eat whatever I want, whenever I want and stuff my face. Right. Well, what if we just say, you know what, my goal is to take good care of me you know, and try to make sure that I'm hydrated and well nourished and eating good, nourishing, wholesome, hearty foods that are going to make me feel energized and make me feel like, yeah, I just had like a 
like fruits and vegetables and they're tasty and they're fresh and they're good. And I invested in really taking good care of my body. Um, yes. And I also can have treats if I want to, um, but I'm going to also make sure that I move every day because I know that it's just so good for me to clear my head and get fresh air. And then, you know, and, and then probably that will reflect in having a healthier complexion and better stamina and a better sense of self image. Like if you're using your body and nourishing it and taking care of it in a way that you feel good about and empowered about, so you, it won't really matter as much like what that number on the scale is or what, what size your clothing is. It'll just feel like I can, I can stand proud and know that I'm leading a life that's in harmony with my values in health as well as in other things. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I actually, I talk about this a lot. Like I've, got, I've given workshops with Rachel Tuckman and I speak about this with my clients. Like you only have, okay, we all know you only have a certain amount of physical energy, but you actually only have a, a certain amount of emotional energy. So yeah. if like, 90% and by the way um people with eating disorders they think about food 80 to 100 percent of the time so anyways and people with disordered eating so like if you're thinking about um food and your body 80 to 100 percent of the time like you can't you can't be thinking about like wait how is that you from important things yeah yeah exactly like if you were like okay i'm not going to think about my weight i'm not going to think about excessively thinking about like what I'm eating I'm just going to take care of myself in a way and that's what intuitive eating does we, we talk about what foods feel good in your body looking at the hunger fullness scale how hungry am I how full am I am I practicing good self-care am I using food as self-care right and then you're like okay so I'm using I'm using that emotional energy to focus on taking care of myself and then you have all that other emotional energy to focus on like how you actually feel and actually like using that emotional energy to do productive things yeah yeah I mean, in general, when you're dealing with any kind of obsessional, unhealthy focus, that's part of the, that's part of the loss. It, it's not even just the, oh no, I'm so stressed out about this thing that I'm hyper-focused on, but then I'm losing out on all the other things in my life that I could be dedicating that attention and that mindfulness to, whether it's relationships or work or interests or spirituality or, or um, community service, like what other, all the other things that are important to people, they fall by the wayside. Did you happen to come across that book, Stick Figure by Lori Gottlieb? No, I feel like you would like that book. Lori Gottlieb wrote, uh, maybe you should talk to someone. Have you seen that book around? Yeah. yeah. You told me that. I told you. Oh, yeah. it's such a nice book. So her other book, Stick Figure, is a completely different kind of book. It's based on her journals from when she was anorexic as an 11-year-old. She was inpatient wow. anorexic. Wow. Um, and she put together her, she had journaled, I guess, pretty consistently throughout the whole time period. And it reminds me when you were saying like people who have like true clinical eating disorders, because I think our whole society is somewhat eating disordered, but yeah. um, not, our, not every single person, but like as a, as a community, I think we are struggling with just like an unbalanced relationship. Oh no. I still hear you, if that helps. We lost you, Ali Sheva. We're going to wait for her to come back on. She has a lot of good things to say. Actually, just to, to point out that most people, I mean, general society does have disordered eating. So it's really pretty crazy. Let's see where she is. Let's see if I can get her.